Hi, and welcome to Bio 100. This is your teacher, Dr. Randy Papke, and I am going to lecture to you today about Chapter 1, Scientific Thinking. Before we get started with that, I just wanted to, again, say welcome to the class. Um, the textbook that we're going to be using is What is Life? And you um, hopefully have a hard copy of this textbook, The Three Ring hole punched and have put that in a binder, that's great. Uh, have you, if you haven't done that yet, that's fine. You might alternatively be using only the online textbook. The thing about my class is that you definitely need to bring a textbook to class with you every day. So if you are relying on the online textbook, that means that you need to bring a computer or a, um, an iPad or some sort of device unless you have a big screen phone probably your phone is not your best bet for this so um, so either bringing the hard copy or some device that will allow you to get on the Wi-Fi system in school and to um, to be able to look at your textbook um, if you're already watching this video that means you've already been on blackboard which good job um, you maybe not have gone to visit the uh, the publisher's website and that is definitely essential to being successful in this class there are weekly assignments on um, on the online publishers website and you can get there through blackboard uh, but or you can also just kind of go there directly there will be instructions on the first day of class if you didn't go to the first day of class please make sure that you come and see me in person to get those instructions. Okay, so that's that's the intro that um, I wanted to tell you about. There are there are points on online, ten points this week. So hopefully you will will take care of that and not fall behind on your online assignments. So um, we are going to go ahead and dive into the lecture. And this is chapter one. There are some learning objectives for this chapter. Uh, defining science, define biology, describe scientific thinking. We'll go into a lot of details on that, including key aspects of well-designed experiments, um, how you can use this chapter of scientific thinking in making wise decisions in your life, and then describing the major themes in biology. So that's the plan for the lecture. And starting out with what is science, what is biology? Here's the thing, you're, you're already a scientist. Um, you might not have realized it, but since you're a human being with a brain, you are already a scientist. Humans are we're curious organisms. Um, you have spent your life asking questions of yourself or questions of others about how the world works. And, um, and maybe you've been able to figure out some of those answers for yourself or been able to find some of those answers. Um, the questions you see on the screen here are important and serious questions. Um, you know, does the radiation released by cell phones cause brain tumors? This is something that you might be reading about or hearing about um, all the time. Uh, are antibacterial soaps better than regular soap? It seems like antibacterial soaps are everywhere, right? So maybe you think that they're better. It's a good scientific question to ask, well, are they better? Um, morning breath is smelly, is there anything you can do to prevent it, and and so forth. Um, I like the next one, why is it easier to remember gossip than physics equations? And uh, why is it so much easier for infants to learn language than it is for a college student to learn biology? So um, those are all questions like you might have considered, and um, the book will actually help answer a lot of these questions. So if you're still not convinced that you're a scientist, uh, here's something important to know. You don't actually need to have an advanced degree or some secret knowledge to, uh, to, or t years of like training to, to, be, to do science, right? To be, think about yourself as a scientist. It does though, it really does require you to um, have that big brain and curiosity. Um, if you're curious, you can do things like make observations. You, 
but that can only take you so far. Like you can you can make observations, but really science wants to know why things are explaining how something happens. And that takes a little bit more, you know, careful, methodical, um, you know, objective, rational analysis. And we try not to be like clouded by our emotions when we do science. It's not always possible, but um, it's definitely something that we strive for. So science isn't just this body of facts that you have to memorize for this class. It's actually um, an intellectual activity and, and that's important for you to kind of remember. And that's one of the reasons why you're taking this class. So hopefully maybe I've convinced you a little bit more that you're already a scientist and you maybe just need a little bit of background to help you with this intellectual activity that you'll be doing with me for the next semester. Um, we're going to start to explore how science can be like really useful in, in thinking, using to think about your life. But let's take a look at how an understanding of the world can actually enhance your scientific thinking. Like how do you know when something is true? So you maybe you've seen Coco Crispy's uh, claim that it now helps support your child's immunity. Um, can you trust, do you, how do you know that's true? How can you trust a company that is making these broad claims where you're just like, ah, oh, it's on the box, you know, maybe that's true. So being able to think scientifically actually helps um, put the claims of help support your child's immunity or things along those lines to the test. Um, there's lots of things out there. You might have seen yogurt advertising that it helps prevent colds or flu, things along those lines. So, um, so how do we put these things to the test? And really, the first step is, um, is having that ability to think scientifically. And, um, and, and really importantly, you've got to have scientific literacy. And literacy liter like literally means just being able to read carefully and understand what the, um, the knowledge base is today. And, and again, a lot of this, this semester, you're going to be learning about this. Um, but your textbook is a really good one, I think, because it uses a lot of examples uh, beyond biology about how to think scientifically. So I'm glad that you're listening to my lectures. I also strongly encourage you to read through the textbook. I don't use all of the textbook. I don't do every single thing that your textbook talks about, although I do try to stay to it pretty carefully. So that's, that is a strength of your textbook. Um, so fortunately, you know, re learning the facts that you need to know about science in order to have scientific literacy, that's, that's actually not too very hard. Um, I'm confident that you can do that. And it's totally essential for understanding um, you know, your health or society, medicine, politics, even um, economics, legal issues, all of these things are, um, are really important that you have some background information. Like, like uh, one that's really been big in the news lately is uh, 23andMe, and they are actually selling your information to pharmaceutical companies. So, um, so that's an intersection of science and, and, uh, and politics. And so, and, you know, and social stuff and medicine and all of these things kind of go together. So, um, one of, like one of the things you might've learned is that in reading casually, maybe reading newspapers is that, um, unsaturated fats are healthier for you than saturated fats. And you might, you might have asked why, right? So taking information and asking the next question. Um, water allergies, why do they strike children from clean homes more than they do children from dirty homes? Maybe you're not even aware of that, but there's a whole hypothesis out there that um, allergies are increasing because we're actually more clean than we've ever been before. And maybe that cleanliness is not great to, to a large extent or to some extent anyway. And then, of course, well, farmers around here are dealing with agricultural pests all the time, but it turns out like 
the pests are appearing faster than the new pesticides can um, can come up. So um, more more biological literacy. Basically, all that uh, biological literacy does is um, helps you understand the big picture. Um, and, you know, society and stuff. But it also happens like helps you personally. Um, so hopefully by the end of this semester, you'll be able to use the process of science to think creatively about things that actually affect you and then, and then communicate those to others. We will spend a lot of time in class trying to learn how to communicate your thoughts to others. Sometimes this makes people uncomfortable, but it's, it's really essential for doing well in this class and also in society to be able to communicate your thoughts to others. And then probably the most important here is to then integrate them into your decision making. It's not just something that some expert claims. It's something that you have, um, you have been delving into and reading about and, and are able to make a wise decision based on what you've been learning. So one of the things that's really important about scientific thinking is that it's empirical and basically this means that the knowledge that we talk about is based on experience and observations that are rational and testable and repeatable um, so that's that's why science is empirical um, science is also something that a lot of other realms are not and that it is self-correcting when science finds out that they've been thinking about something wrong, it corrects itself and it takes these new observations and these new ideas in and gets rid of old ideas that don't work. So if our observations in science, if they don't support the current hypothesis, the hypothesis must be given up or revised in order to be so that it's not contradicting um, the new information that we have. It tells us we should change our minds. That's so powerful about science is uh, you don't get stuck in one way of thinking. You, you have to learn how to change your mind. So um, so that's, that's what we're going to do next is we're going to delve into these um, the steps that we call the scientific method. And I I want you to know right up front, especially if you are planning on reading, that your book and I do disagree on a few little things. Um, and one of them is how many steps are in the scientific method, but this isn't that big a deal. Um, your book and I actually completely agree, and I you might be asking yourself, how can you say you disagree but then agree? So um, here's how we agree. Your book says five steps. Um, we both agree that the first step is observation. And your, your book, though, kind of lumps two and three together. And I'm going to, I'm breaking them apart. Your book actually talks about questioning and hypothesis generation in the same step. Um, and then it also lumps designing a test and making predictions together. So I, I talk a lot about how to design a test. Making predictions is a lot easier. Your book spends more time talking about making predictions and um, throws in, well, but you have to have a well-designed test in order to do that. So again, we, we're not really disagreeing. I'm just saying seven steps and your book says five. We, we, all, we both agree on those as the final two steps. One of the things that's important about this is that I won't actually test you on like a question on a test. What is step four of the scientific method? I won't do that uh, because your book and I do disagree. So let's go ahead and dive into the first step and this is this is the easiest one because it's the one that you do on a regular basis there's no sorry about that um there's no time in your life that you aren't making observations and these observations can be made with any of your senses we tend to think about uh, using your eyes as observation but really that's not correct for here's a good example from your book um taking echinacea seems to, to a lot of people, reduce the likelihood of catching the common cold. You've probably heard about that. Maybe you've taken echinacea supplements. And so that might be an observation that you've made by hearing somebody else tell you this. 
or by taking the echinacea supplements yourself and noticing that, hey, I haven't been getting many colds or my cold hasn't been as bad as, you know, your neighbors. And so um, that makes it okay. So, um, so that's observation. You make observations all the time. It's really quite straightforward to think about. Um, so let's go ahead and investigate a little bit more uh, in the next step, and that is questioning. Again, this is my second step. Your, your book lumps questioning and hypothesis together. And I understand why that is, because my, my first point in uh, step two is that you need to generate a question. And a lot of times these questions are called causal questions. That's how you pronounce this word. It's causal, not casual. If it was casual, it would be C-A-S-U-A-L. It's is causal. And your root word there is because. It's, it's part of the word because. So causal questions are any questions that lead to explanations. They tend to ask how things work or why things occur. And if you answer a causal question, you, what you're doing is you're giving a hypothesis. And so... Again, I understand why your book lumps them together, but stay with me while I, while I help you pull them apart. Um, a, a hypothesis is a possible explanation. You can see that I've highlighted that right there. It's a little bit more complicated than just a possible explanation. Um, it is a single statement that is specific, but also kind of tentative. Like you, you, you mean you're not sure that that the hypothesis is correct. And it's also regarding something really specific, a single phenomenon. So you can hear me saying that hypotheses are very narrow, um, but they are also answers to causal questions. So we're still in step two questioning, but it's really hard for me to talk to about questioning without also bringing up step three, hypothesis generation. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at what I mean by a causal question. I've got some examples for you here. The first one is, why do peacocks have such showy tails? You can see, you, everybody's seen or heard about peacocks. Um, they have these brilliant, bright blue and green tails with these eye spots on them. Why do peacocks have such showy tails? This is an example of a causal question. If I'm a asking you this question and, <clears throat> and you're trying to answer it, good for you. Think about your answers that you have started coming up with. Why do peacocks have such cherry tails? Well, maybe it's to attract a mate. Good, you've probably heard that before. But that's not the only possible answer, attracting a mate. Maybe, you hear how tentative I'm say, sounding here, maybe it's um, to scare off predators. I mean, those are big eye spots. Maybe it's to scare off predators. There's actually, you, if you spend a little time thinking about it, there are dozens of possible reasons why peacocks have such showy tails. Again, not focusing on the possible explanations, not focusing on the hypotheses, understanding that the question is causal is kind of what I want you to get out of this. Turns out that any question that starts with the word why is automatically a causal question. Why? Because and you hear that cause, the causal root there. Um, the next one is also a causal question. How is body temperature controlled in humans? This is getting to um, explaining a mechanism. Well, how is it controlled in humans? Well, maybe it's controlled by um, some part of the brain, or maybe it's controlled by how many clothes you're wearing, or maybe it's controlled by your mood. You can hear that I'm giving you tentative explanations for how this might be controlled. And that's how you recognize that you've got a causal question. So, um, so the next one is what causes birds to fly south? And also definitional, if it says what causes, it's asking for an explanation. So what causes birds to fly south? Uh, temperature, sun levels, you know, those kinds of things, those can cause birds to fly south. That makes what causes questions, <clears throat> it makes that a causal question. Um, the next one is how do bees recognize flowers? And again, this is an example of a causal question. It's one of the harder ones because it doesn't start with a why or what causes, it starts with how. And not all how questions are causal questions. 
Um, how are you doing? We literally just wanted you to answer that question. But how do bees recognize flowers? You're asking for an explanation for how they do this thing. So that makes it causal. Um, not all questions are causal questions. And we're going to go through and think about some alternative types of questions. Your book also brings uh, this up. So here's an example. Where do hummingbirds migrate to in winter? You're asking where. And you could come up with answers. You know, you could say Mexico, or you could say the Caribbean islands. But, but Mexico is not an explanation. It's just a location. And so while there are many possible locations, locations are not explanations. So we would say that where do hummingbirds migrate to in winter is actually a descriptive question. Descriptive questions are really useful in science. A lot of um, science is done by looking at descriptive questions. You don't need a hypothesis to answer them. But sometimes we have prediction, we predict things with them. Predictions are not hypotheses, and unfortunately, um, a lot of high schools get those things mixed up. So we're going to spend a little bit of time making sure we understand the difference between hypotheses and prediction. If I say, where do hummingbirds migrate to in winter, and you answer it with Mexico, you are predicting that you, when you go to make that observation, you'll find it there. So a little bit different. And then this next one is, do bees use color to recognize flowers? This is a special kind of question because it is actually a hypothesis. Remember that hypotheses are explanations. And if you read this question, do bees use color to recognize flowers? It's already got a built-in explanation, a built-in hypothesis that answers a causal question. How do bees recognize flowers? And if you think about it on the last slide, if you want to rewind a second, um, you'll see that question. So this kind of question, do bees use color to recognize flowers, these hypotheses in the form of questions, those are, um, they're trickier to recognize. You have to understand what a hypothesis is in order to recognize that this is already a hypothesis. And it's in the form of a question because remember I said that um, hypotheses feel tentative? And some students, this is what I, why I bring this up, some students feel so tentative about their uh, hypotheses that they're offering that they get, they get like, so tentative they put it in a question form. And I'm just wanting you to recognize that the hypothesis is color, right? How do bees recognize flowers? They use color. Or maybe you're feeling so tender you say, well, do they use color? Right? They're the same thing. They're both hypotheses. So I've got a bunch of questions here for you, and I'm, I'm going to ask you to think about them. I'll give you the answers at the end, but I want you to think about them as we're going along. So here's the first one. Where did I leave my keys? Get out a piece of paper and write down what kind of question you think it is. Is it a descriptive question? Is it a causal question? Or is it a hypothesis in the form of a question? Why do I keep losing my keys? What kind of question is that? Do I have dementia? What kind of question is that? You can pause this video at any time. The next question is, how did the HIV virus evolve? Think about that one. Uh, here's one. I've already used this as an example in this lecture. How are you today? What kind of question did I say that was? How are you today? Here's one from your book. Does echinacea reduce the intensity of the common cold? And one more question for you. Why do female honeybees mate with 10 or more different males? I know this last one is weird, but I will come back to it in a second. Just, I just want you to think about what type of question is it? Descriptive, causal, or hypothesis? So let's go through these and answer the questions. What type of question is this? And hopefully you got them all right. You're playing along with me. 
Um, where did I leave my keys? That's a descriptive question. Just careful observation alone is going to, to um, answer that question. Why do I keep losing my keys? Yeah, that's a causal question. Any question that starts with why is automatically a causal question. Do I have dementia? I keep losing my keys. Why do I keep losing my keys? Maybe I have dementia? Or I could just say, oh, maybe it's dementia. Right? One's a question, one's a statement, but they're both hypotheses. Um, so this is a hypothesis. How did the HIV virus evolve? Well, that is an interesting question. Um, there's lots of possible ways that it could have evolved, so that makes this a causal question. How are you today? That is a descriptive question. I already gave that one away earlier in this lecture, so hopefully you caught on to that. Um, the next one is, does echinacea reduce the intensity of the common cold? And that is a hypothesis. Your book, remember that your book talks about this one a lot. And, um, and it lumps questions with hypotheses. And a lot of the questions that it's asking are already hypotheses. And that's fine, but we are going to learn a little bit more careful examination of this. So, so, um, so yeah, that one is a hypothesis. The final one, why do female honeybees mate with 10 or more different males? That's clearly a causal question. It starts with the word why. And I, I know it's a weird question, but that's the question that you and I are going to work through together as we um, explore, finish exploring this idea of how to work through the scientific method. Now, I do try to keep my lectures to under 30 minutes um, just for being able to download these really easily. So I'm going to stop lecturing now and restart up with the next the video in part two of chapter one. So I'll see you in a minute on the next video where we will answer this question, why do female honeybees mate with 10 or more different mammals?